So, this shoemaker, who perhaps has given you uh, shoddy work, uh, some uh, poor uh, pair of shoes, however, he took you your money. He proved to be very good, very good at what? Taking your money, right? So he's good at making money, but that's not his quality, that shouldn't be his quality as a shoemaker. As a shoemaker, you're going to call him a bad shoemaker, right? He will not be able to, he did not perform according to what he wants, right? So what is a ruler, right? What is the purpose of rule? It's not to make money, because that's the money making uh, business. You know, if you're in the business of money making, yeah, uh, then, you know, if you make money, you're good. But the ruler, the, the word rule, to rule, I mean to, to govern, right? What it means, Plato asks, and Aristotle follows on the, uh, the same line of thought, is to act for the good of those who are ruled. So the purpose of government, of governing the city, is the, the good of those who are the members of it. What you mentioned, uh, briefly, some of you in the discussion of uh, a week ago, <coughs> the good of the people, and you kind of hinted for it, uh, to it at it. Even your criticisms of government or of politics hints at the fact that there is a way it should be done. And what do you expect that to be? Usually, even if you're disappointed with how things are, quote unquote, you expect it to be for the good of the root. Yeah, that's that's why we criticize the uh, politics or politicians or whatever. So the good of the of those who uh, who are ruled is the purpose of government. Is the purpose of government. Uh, accordingly, then there are different types of regimes. Talk, Plato talks about different types of regimes, and so does uh, Aristotle, but a little bit different. Um, Aristotle groups them very simply, right? You can you can group you can uh, classify the regimes according to. Uh, the form of government, meaning how much, how many people rule, especially the time that was, you know, kind of a, a good uh, uh, measurement. And oh, then you can uh, classify them according to the um, the purpose of government. Does it fit the real purpose of government or not? So the six forms of rule, according to Aristotle, will be ruled by one, ruled by few, and the ruled by many. Right? You can be ruled by one person, a few person, or many person. Now, each of these forms can be done, right? Each of these forms can be done for the good of the people, according to the nature of rule, or not for the good of the people, but for the good of the rulers. Okay? Aristotle is an observer. He knows very well. These are, this is how things go. Just like Plato did, by the way. So, <coughs> rule by one, for the good of the people, Aristotle calls monarchy. Meaning, one person rules. Monarchy. Right? Mono, arcos, uh, it's rule by one. Right? Monarchy. Rule by one, for the good of the ruler, and not for the good of the people, is of course tyranny. Yeah. Rule by a few, for the good of the people, I think you see where I'm going, is aristocracy. Again, not in the sense in which we use the word, but in the sense of rule, kratos, krasi, of aristoi, which is the few or the best. The best for the good of the people. Or, the opposite, the rule of the few for their own good, is oligarchy. Which is ruled by the few, oligo, which is few, less. Now, many, how do you call, let's look at the bad side, how do you call, <coughs> excuse me, the rule of the many, for the good of the many? Well, just like in Plato, it is the rule of unbridled self-satisfaction of the masses. Yes, it is democracy, in the sense of the recognized. And perhaps here, although the discussion is 
what we have uh, from Aristotle, uh, politics, uh, I think also the ethics, are actually not books written by Aristotle, but are course notes from his pupils. So uh, the, the way their uh, the, the thinking, the way the ideas are developed in these, in these books, is very organic. So sometimes Aristotle follows the line of thought that he leaves it behind and then moves on. So it's a little bit harder to um, synthesize, in a way, or organize than uh, other authors. But still, it works. So the rule of man, in a way, for the good of the whole, the scholarship sort of assumes m m that Aristotle means the polity. P-O-L-I-T-Y But this is not the simple, it's not the rule of the masses. It's, it's something else and we're going to talk about it in a second. So, good rule by one monarchy, good rule by few aristocracy, good, good rule by many polity. You see, he's, he, he leaves space for things to happen. There are many possibilities. The point is, how do we arrange it so that it's for the good of the people? The rule of the uh, the bad forms of rule, rule of one tyranny, of the few oligarchy, of the many democracy. democracy. Now, let's look for a second to politics, this, this ideal, and in many ways that, you know, um, although monarchy is an ideal, the best possible rule, because Aristotle differentiates between ideal, meaning in theory, what could be thought of with possible. So the best possible regimes among those forms that he has identified, and he's traveled, you know, he's the first, as I said, the first comparativist, the first comparative political scientist. Because he traveled around and he took notes on different political regimes and then measured them and reached a conclusion. That's comparative politics, as we're talking about. So, he went around and he looked at various possibilities. And he was, you know, observer, a realist, a skeptic, or whatever. And among the possible forms of good rule were the ones I mentioned. And the best seems to be perhaps monarchy in the sense of you know, someone who is really good but not really possible that you'll find this sort of a philosopher king, but actually, actually the polity. And polity is, would be what? Again, Aristotle, practical minded as he is in the sense of an observer and one who takes notes and you know, looks at reality as it is, he noticed, which Plato also knew, that in every city there are basically two major groups, two important groups. There are the few who are the rich, or the rich one, the few, remember, right? And there are the many who are the poor. That's, you know, since the beginnings of time. Now, there might be also a sort of a middling class, a middling sort of a population, and it's neither here nor there. And the problem is that each of these classes, if you don't have the middle one, the rich have their virtues, you know, just like in Plato, in the sense of diligence or whatever they have. The poor have their virtues, but also their faults, and remember the eos of democracy. But it seems to be the middle. Surprise, surprise! that Aristotle uh, pushes for and pushes forward and argues for. And he says that the best arrangement, so the rule of the many, will actually be a rule in which rich and poor, few and many, share in responsibilities. And each of them get something so that they make the city work. Remember, this is not the best ideal regime, this is the best possible regime, namely the polity. Right? Best possible. Right? He, what, what he thinks is achievable in the world. So, in order for the good of all, and to make the city work, each of them needs to get something. The rich will demand that they have the same government. Well, not surprisingly, right? Uh, interest groups today and lobbies and so on, they do demand to have a voice in government. The poor, however, want to get the benefits of good government. Right? And they might even be you know, willing to give and, and to have a say in government, at least by electing who, who of the rich will govern them, and so on. The point is that they need to share in burdens and sharing benefits. All of them need to be satisfied, all of them need to participate. 
Democracy, the, the bad form, is when they will rule in their own interest, overwhelming the few rich, exploiting them, and so on, for, for, uh, for, for Aristotle. However, here's where the middle comes into place. The best, lucky, lucky form, fortunate form, would be one in which there is a middle class that is significant. And it, at that time it was uh, not as often encountered, right? That is significant. Why, he said, because they are the most prone to virtues, because none of the extremes, they don't belong to any of the extremes, and remember, extremes are not, are not good. <laughs> They're not, the, they don't correspond with the right direction of life, the right direction of, for the human being. So it's actually a large middle class. A large middle class that should balance, that could balance the city so that it doesn't become rambunctious, that it actually doesn't lead to revolution. Because one of the main concerns, both you saw that in Plato with the changes from one regime to the other, also Aristotle, is that if you have this <coughs> continuous tension between many poor, few rich, <coughs> you will have conflict. You will have conflict. Yes, you will. And the middle is the balancing one, and also the people who are not extremely rich, which leads to greed and whatever, extremely poor, which leads to envy and whatever, but they are in the middle. So this is the best possible regime, perhaps, of poverty. How about because we talked about the best possible, <coughs> what is the ideal? Well, remember what was the ideal life? The, uh, the, the, let's say the best possible life, not possible in the sense that the other one is not possible, but the best life for the most human beings, regular human beings, we talked about this, is a fulfillment in the city. Because the human being needs the city to both be active, ethically involved, uh, uh, do because without doing it, you're not an you can't learn to act ethically without doing it. In order to do it, you need to be in relationship with other human beings in the city to become a fully human being. <coughs> the city meaning, you know, obviously, the city state in Greece was about the size of Ellensburg. Uh, the city of the empire can be done. Now, <coughs> the best possible life for a human being, right, the best common life, rather, is this in the city. But what is the best ideal life, remember, for, a, for an individual human being? It is the life, according to the mind, it is a life of contemplation. And some do it. These are the philosophers, those who he puts outside the city, remember, on the sliding, sliding scale, they, they, they are demigods, they are they're above the needs of the human. They spend their lives in contemplation. They don't need the other human being. They have, they, um, have surpassed, in a way, uh, this condition. Not that they're not human beings. Well, at that point, it wasn't fixed towards a human being. But not that <coughs> they fly around in caves like Superman. But the life of contemplation, they dedicate them, uh, themselves to it. They don't anymore need the city as such. Now, if we were to think of, a, of an ideal city, not the best possible, ideal. Remember again, best possible is what he knows can be done. Ideal is what theoretically, according to what, is, uh, what we know about human beings and the, uh, what they are, what theoretically should, you know, should be pitch, could be pictured. But he never says that it can be achieved to the country. Eh? Ideal. Well, the best ideal world for the, for the citizens, for the, for the human beings, is a life of contemplation. But how can you live a life of contemplation in a city who's got to do the work? Right? How can you live a life of leisure, which you need for contemplation, not, you know, sitting back and doing nothing? Remember, this is a life of pursuing the highest in you. Right? <coughs> how can you do that? That's not a city. Or is it? Well, he puts down briefly a, a, a picture of this ideal, ideal, theoretical system. And he goes from, then we'll talk about the ideal size, the ideal territory. So what is really best fit for, for, uh, for, for everything? But uh, the, <laughs> the core of it to uh, end on the, uh, end on the, on a slightly, you know, problematic note, so to speak, <coughs> the core of the city will be a population of the citizens who live a life of contemplation. Vision. What allows them to live a life of contemplation is a population of slaves 
and other laborers, preferably from other national, no, national groups is inappropriate, from other peoples, so not part of the city. Remember, this Greek city state was, they were actually bounded, this fund they were, by the blood relations. So it was based on clan relations. So you could know, you kind of knew who was from elsewhere. And they were very tiny, right? So this is how they could be. <coughs> but these would be from other peoples, from other, uh, you know, Greek people, but other uh, cities, so to, speak, so to speak. Or they would be slaves. And what would they do? They would be the producers, the laborers. They would produce, they would um, allow for this ideal uh, lifestyle to, 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 to function within a clearly and very strictly delineated uh, territory and a strict number, which is the ideal, and it goes into detail. Again, remember, that's the theoretical, which he doesn't say at any point that it is possible, but he, he, takes, he takes his intuition about human beings to the to the utmost. Uh, what he knows about human beings, and he tries to set up both the possible way to, uh, for human beings to organize themselves <coughs> according to that, as well as the ideal way for human beings to organize themselves and to uh, live in a city. Now, as I told you about Plato, and before at the beginning of uh, the last lecture, if you think that some of these conclusions are uh, problematic, so to speak, that was the word I was, I was looking for, or rather controversial, good for you, but remember, these are serious thinkers. They really look around, just like you, growing up, and ask yourself, okay, his life, that, you know, what is this all about? And they pers what they learn, they really... Um, want to learn the truth about existence, and they really follow these assumptions to the, to the natural conclusion. Now, if the, the conclusions that they reach are not to seem, sen uh, you sense that they, would, they don't fit the human being, well, maybe their assumptions in a certain point went astray. And just to, you know, to end as we began, remember, this has to do, as you see, with their conception of the whole of this cosmological view of the world in which disorder and order is together. Why does it have to do with this? Because <coughs> in both authors, again, Aristotle doesn't say that the ideal is possible, right? So, less Aristotle. But if you take only the ideal image of the city from Aristotle, then both Plato and Aristotle, when they talk about ideal, ideal theoretical city, they, they find a source of order in this whole, in the world, in the universe, everything together. Yeah? Which for Aristotle, for example, is, are all these aspects that we talked about. Teleology, the, how the human being is constituted, the rational part, all these things. Now what the theory is, uh, in Plato is the form, the, the theory of knowledge that, you know, with the cave, going out, knowing the good, shaping your soul, coming back, what human being is constituted of, ra rational, spirited, appetitive, all those. So they take things that are what? Order. Why are they order or manifestations of order? Because these are certainties. These explain the functioning yeah, of, of the world. These are regularities, just like in math, the principles, the algorithms, the theorems, right? P Pythagoras, right? Famous philosopher as I mentioned in my notes. Philosopher was actually a cult leader in a way, right? Because what he was about was about how to live. And he, he had a whole problem. What did Pythagoras do? He found certain regularities, numerical relations between things that he applied to music, because it works, guess what? He applied to astronomy, because it works, guess what? This is why math explains the world to a degree, is because these relationships, we encounter them everywhere. The same for Plato, the same for Aristotle, no, it's, it's the same process, which is knowledge. Knowledge is, again, remember our discussion, knowledge is understanding reality. I'm here, my task is to understand the whole. And whatever order or, or relationships I, fi I find, the definition, right, the, the connection that explains it, right, I, I start from that, from what I know. 
The problem is this tension between order and disorder. And since everything is part of one, then obviously if I find really get a hold of this source of order and just apply it on the whole thing, maybe I can order it. And that's the idea. That's the ideal city. That's the ideal city for Plato, that's the ideal city for Aristotle, although he knows he's not possible because again he doesn't he look he's a natural scientist, he goes around, he observes, and he's seen that no. Yeah. But for both of them that's the same process. The process is if I know if math explains the world, let's just apply math to everything and guess what? Modern sciences, including political science, there's a huge debate going around between is this a science if you don't use math? Right? It's right it's it's still going on, although you know it's kind of failing right now. So that's the tension. And I'll leave it here because we're gonna continue when we talk about authors from the say post Christian or Christian era, you see how the, the whole view of the world changes and that changes also our responses to politics and so on. But this is one of the if you want to look at the root of the causes, why they posit such ideal things that what well, Plato says that children should be selected and poets should be banished and it's quite brutal. Yeah? Well, this is why. Because if you know what's right, if you know what's right, why not apply it? Yeah? But, and we say, oh, yeah, sure, unless suddenly you think, wait a minute, how about dictatorship, how about you know, Major Mike, uh, Mayor Mike Bloomberg trying to ban big sodas, the big gulp or whatever it was, right? That's, that's what he did. He tried to, he knew what was right, tried to apply it. Because it's right. So, there's this tension. And we'll talk about this tension in order to sort of as follows. Finally, to end, to conclude this um, discussion of Aristotle, I'm moving on now to a short introduction on Thucydides. Uh, <coughs> Thucydides you're going to read the Median Dialogue. What I wanted to know about Thucydides is that, well, first of all, he actually lived around the time of uh, Socrates and Plato. But so Plato and uh, Aristotle are better to start with to than go to Thucydides. He wasn't a political thinker. He was a general in the army who participated in the brutal, brutal wars between the Athenian Empire and the allies of Sparta, uh, which you will see in the in the text that is referred to as the Sedemon, the Sedemon, in the Median Dialogue, that's what we posted. So he was a general who, you know, commanded ships in the navy. He was blamed for a major failure, a major defeat of the Athenian navy, and he was sent into exile. And I think he was in exile for about 20 years, and this is when he becomes a writer, right? Well, you know, second job. And he becomes a writer, and actually the first historian as we understand historians, because Previous historians wrote from what they heard and checked and whatever, but he actually did documentary work. He went around and documented the Peloponnesian War, which was this war between, between Athens and Sparta, that he also participated in, but he went to actual people who were there. He went to the places, and he did sort of documentary work to give a story of this war. But why did he do that? He did that because he wanted to draw bigger conclusions about the nature of politics, especially international politics, the nature of war, and so on. So we're going to read from him only the Median Dialogue, which is a dialogue between the uh, Athenian sort of invaders and the tiny island of Melos, who were allies of Sparta. I think even a colony of Sparta initially. So <coughs> the whole dialogue happens when the Athenian huge army has circled blockaded Melos, the island of Melos, and now there's a dialogue. Is it a dialogue? Well, a discussion, negotiation maybe, you see, between the Athenian generals and the representatives of the small people of Melos. Thucydides is considered to be the father of political realism, quote-unquote realism, because he, he says, well, he purports to, to, to show things and to say things as they are, and you recognize uh, some of these attitudes. But anyway, this was a, just a, sh a short introduction to this. The next lecture, uh, we will move on to the, the Christian in the sense of 
after the apparition of after Christianity comes about and spreads and change the, the perspective on the world changes. So we talk about certain thinkers uh, within that framework, and then of course Machiavelli. And as I said in the documents posted earlier, that's going to conclude our brief survey of political philosophy. However, we will talk about two other political philosophers uh, next week, Hobbes and Locke, because they set the assumptions for the modern political uh, uh, systems that we will discuss. Okay, thank you.